and a um, couple things I want you to be aware of. This being 2018, we have licensing um, coming up for the plumbing licensing. So these meetings each month, you get some CE credit. We will be offering uh, CE classes. If you want to have your company do them all at one time, we can arrange for that. Um, just don't leave it until November the 30th. That makes it a little bit more difficult. Which well, a lot of contractors license or plumbing license? Plumbing license. <clears throat> and if you take the classes from us, we can give you the credit for both. So that makes it nice. You only have to sit through the one class to get credit for both. Ooh. So it makes it good. So you've received plenty of emails from me the last few days. I'm just trying to get the information out to you. Uh, CE classes. We're going to offer some CE classes in St. George uh, on February the 17th. Uh, we also have our St. George conference coming up on the 15th and 16th. And there will be CE classes there. Lots of fun. We have uh, a lot of vendors that are going to be there. They're signing up quickly. Uh, we just need uh, the plumbers to sign up as well, and we're getting some of those. So we'd love to have you down there. Like I said, we'll have some. This is probably the best set of classes we've had. So um, please uh, sign up and come on down. You need to get your rooms booked. Uh, if you want, book through uh, La Quinta. You just need to tell them you're with UPHCA. I've held a few rooms there. Uh, but they're loaded. Everybody is busy down there. Um, let's see. I think that pretty well does it. We, Byron and I actually saw each other at a meeting yesterday that had, I can't remember the guy's name. James Woods. James Woods. He is, uh, I've been to several of his uh, briefings over the years, and he's really good. He knows what he's talking about talking about uh, the economy and what he sees in the future in his uh, crystal ball. And he continues to see uh, 18 and 19 <coughs> move, move very well for construction. There's a lot of, lot of um, um, work on the books. And of course, you're not you realize that yourselves, but he says that uh, if it does go through 19, that will probably be the one of the longest stretches we've had of good economic times than he's seen for a long time, didn't he say? Ten years? Yeah, it's he says, bull market in history. Yeah. Yeah. If he says eight years is uh, near the record, so ten years would probably be a record for yeah, a, would be. a bull market. So okay. I guess hold your breath and let's hope that it works out. Uh, so uh, labor continues to be a problem. He, he sees that uh, with his data that he's tracking and uh, oh you brought it. What else should are you um, going to mention some of that? I'll, I'll go through Good. this briefly. You? Thank you. Okay so we'll let Byron take care of that. Well okay so we've talked about St. George and once again, uh, uh, we are looking for people to uh, be part of the board, and we have four positions that are um, they're up for election. So we'd uh, like to see any of you that are interested to be a part of the board and uh, give us new ideas, and new thoughts, and and so forth. The legislature just gets you updated there. Uh, they are moving ahead rather rapidly. They continue to look at licensing as a as an evil, and there's uh, looks like there's two or three representatives that will have different bills up there at this point uh, that will would like to do away with some licensing, and it seems the plumbing is on the target for uh, I don't know why we were chosen. But we sure have it. Uh, so we, we need to be very active. Uh, Dave Spadafore and Kate 
and Ashley are going to be really up there full time and uh, I has already done a lot of work ahead of time for us so we appreciate that. So we'll turn the time over to uh, Byron. Byron is with Clifton Larson Allen yes. has which was used to be uh, used to be Galena, used to be Galena, then leverage, and it was previous Cleaver Leverage Group. So yeah, he's been around for 25 years in the construction industry, and uh, and I've known Myron for a lot, a lot of years. Yeah. And he does a great job, and he was chosen. He was a chosen one tonight to come and share with us what we might see and uh, yeah. and uh, taxes and so forth. So I'll turn the time over to you, Byron. Oh, you need a remote, don't you? Yeah. Oh, man. Let me pass these out. For those who uh, are viewing on TV, I'll send out to you the um, PowerPoint that he's giving out. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I've got one. While Dave's working on that, I just want to hit a couple of highlights from the economic summit that the uh, ABC had yesterday. And uh, James Wood was a presenter. Um, 2017 wage growth in Utah was 5.3%. That's all wages. And uh, construction wages in particular have grown to 108% of average wages in Utah. Um, back in 2004 or 5, it was 98% of the uh, average Utah wage. Now it's 108%. So, and you guys are all feeling that pain, I'm sure. Let's see what. Um, Is that working? See if that will work. Yep, that works. Thanks. All good. All good. Another highlight was um, net in migration into Utah. It was very high at 28,000 people. Um, and as far as building. Okay. In 2017, there was 6,700 apartment units put online. I'm sorry, that was 2014. 6,700 apartment units were permitted in uh, 2018. They're predicting about uh, just over 6,000 units. So we're, the apartment um, market's still going to be hot, and so is the residential. Uh, commercial is going to be slightly less in 18, he predicted. But overall, I think uh, the economy in Utah is going to be good the next two years, bar barring any huge outside catastrophe. Any any buttons being pushed by uh, China or North Korea? Yes, yes. So, but today we're here to talk about taxes. The uh, Congress and the President gave us a nice Christmas present uh, back in December, and they passed a uh, tax bill that. Um, for the most part, affects 2018. There's one provision that 
Uh, it was retroactive to uh, part of 2017, but uh, the, uh, the, the goal uh, was to simplify taxes. Um, here's a picture of uh, Paul Ryan and the famous postcard. He, he was trying to uh, lead the effort to simplify taxes so we could... How much do you make? Send it in. So we could, yeah. Two so we, lines we, 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 Yeah, two <laughs> lines. Yeah, yeah, it's... It didn't work out that way. It didn't work out that way. It, it didn't get any simpler. Um, the, the changes to the tax law were, let's see, 85 pay, 185 pages. That's just the changes to the original tax law. Um, is that it? This is it. This is the changes right here. And the original tax bill that this references was passed back in 1986. Um, I think a lot of us in this room have enough gray hair to remember Ronald Reagan. That was his big legacy in, in passing that landmark tax bill. And so this one is a one in a generation tax bill too that was just passed. Um, so it's been what uh, twenty no thirty one years since the last major tax act, and so that's what we have now. So um, is it simpler? Probably not. Is it different? Absolutely. It may be simpler for a few that uh, will not have to itemize anymore because they raised the uh, standard deduction. We'll get into that. But we're first going to talk about individual tax changes and then we'll shift over to uh, changes that affect our businesses. So the first big change to individual tax is the tax rates. Um, currently, we have seven tax rates. We've got 10, 15, 25, 28, 33, 35, and 39.6. You can kind of see the graph there. Um, this next graph is a little different representation of it. Um, so we've got a, a graduated tax scale. So the more you make, the higher your marginal tax rate is. So this graph shows uh, the different tax brackets, and if, so this is married filing joint. The first 18,650 is taxed at 10 percent. The next 56,750 is taxed at 15 percent. The next 77,000 is taxed at 25 percent. The next 80,000 is taxed at 28 percent. Then we got a big 33 percent bracket that taxes 183,000 and change, and on up. So this is our current tax scale, and the next slide here is a comparison of our current tax scale versus the 2018 tax scale. In all cases except for about $25,000 taxed at 400 to 425, the, tax, the new tax rate is lower, which is good for everybody. Um, so that's the first major change. It's just the, the tax rates are lower. Now the top tax rate is 37% rather than 39.6. The bottom rate is still 10%. Um, and if you're not married, the tax brackets are half of what the married filing joint tax bracket, except for the top tax bracket, um, starts at 500. Um, capital gains rates, uh, there's no change. Um, and so if you're married, filing joint, and your taxable income is less than 77000 your capital gains rate is zero, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, and if you're below the top tax bracket, which starts at uh, 479 you're taxed at 15%. Um, and if you're above the top tax bracket, your capital gains are, and um, dividends are taxed at 20%. Um, plus, here's the big plus, we've got this 
uh, net investment income tax of 33.8 percent if your AGI is over 250. So um, your capital gains, if you're in the top tax bracket, is going to be taxed at 23.8 percent. Um, and if you're not in the top top tax bracket, but you're above 250 in income, your capital gains and qualified dividends are going to be taxed at uh, 15 plus 3.8, which is 18.5%. Uh, um, so that's the one thing that didn't change. Um, the one big thing that did change in a an attempt to simplify it is your standard deduction went from if you so this is if you don't do not itemize your deductions, you'll take the standard deduction. And they changed that for married filing joint from 12,700 to 24,000 in an attempt. So fewer people are going to be itemizing their deductions this year, or in 18. This is for 18. For 17, uh, people will still itemize if they've got deductions less than 12,700. And here's the change for single and head of household which is half, singles half of the married filing joint. Um, but with the increase in the standard deduction, they took away personal exemptions. So for 17, um, personal exemptions for you, your spouse, and all of your kids that you uh, support, you get a deduction of $4,050 for each of them. Um, that for 2018 is going to be gone. Um, and in lieu of that, um, child tax credit, right now for 17, if you have a child that's less than 17 years old, you get a thousand dollar per head tax credit. Um, for 2018, that has increased to two thousand dollar per child. Not to simplify things, but just to change things up. And then this is an, a new thing. Um, you get $500 tax credit for non-child dependent. And so for your kids that are 17 or older, plus your, yourself and your spouse, you get a $500 tax credit. So now a tax credit is better than a tax deduction. Tax credits like these reduce your tax bill. So if you got a uh, $200,000 taxable income, tax on that is $25,000, and you get uh, you got two kids that are under 17 plus yourself and your spouse. That's $5,000 of tax credits to reduce your tax bill from 25 to 20,000. So we like tax credits because that reduces your tax bill dollar for dollar. Um, and they increase the phase out for tax credits. Um, the phase out starts at 400,000 married filing joint, and it phases out quickly at 440. I don't have a, that on this slide, but uh, but the phase out increased dramatically. It for 2017 the existing tax bill. Not many of us got uh, tax credits for our kids because we earn too much. So so this is good for for even us that can earn a little bit more uh, as far as tax credits for our kids and now we get a tax credit for ourselves and our spouses and our older kids. My kids just bumped out of the child tax credit so I'm excited about this. I've got kids that are 18. Um, now shifting gears to deductions for those of us that itemize our deductions Normally, we take a deduction for our state income taxes, our property taxes, our mortgage interest, our charitable contributions, and if we've got medical deductions, we get a uh, deduction for that, too. Um, the one big change was uh, currently we get to deduct all of our uh, state income tax and our property taxes. The new law, that is limited to $10,000.
Um, so if you have taxable income of 200000 plus a house, um, you're going to lose some deductions there um, because your state tax on $200,000 is $10,000, 5%. Plus if you've got a house and you've got three or $4,000 of property taxes, um, that's where we start losing deductions. Um, so this is going to hurt those of us with incomes more than 150 ish that have a house. Um, and so hopefully your tax preparer got a hold of you um, in December and told you to prepay your state income tax for 2017 um, because in 2018 it may not be fully deductible. Um, that's the one thing we told a lot of our clients back in December. We saw this coming down the pipe and said prepay your state income tax. Um, unfortunately, we can't prepay our property taxes because the lien doesn't go in effect until 18. Uh, some of us tried to do that, but that didn't work. In other states um, where you have two payments, like California, I think you pay in March and in September, you could prepay. Uh, but um, in most Utah counties, that doesn't work because you just pay once in November. Um, so that was a a big change, um, big issue for those high income states on both coasts, California and New York. That was a big issue uh, to limit that deduction. But somehow in the back rooms of Washington, this provision got pushed through in spite of issues from senators in New York and California. Uh, mortgage interest. Currently, we can deduct all of the mortgage interest on mortgages of up to $1.1 $1 million, including our second home and our home equity loan. Uh, the big change here was the we can now only deduct uh, mortgage interest on mortgages up to $750,000. Is that per mortgage? Or all together. All together. You add your mortgages together. Uh, the, your limit's uh, $1.1 $1 .1 million. Um, and this new provision uh, does not allow uh, mortgage deduction for home equity lines. So if you've got a home equity line and your mortgage is going to be less than $750, you want to really consider refinancing. Um, the new limit of 750 is only on new mortgages that are after December 15th. Um, so if you've got a mortgage that's over 750 right now, you're okay as long as it's under 1.1. Um, but if you refinance in 2018 and have a mortgage over 750, part of that interest is not going to be deductible. What about second homes? Second homes are still good. So we can still have two homes. Um, as long as the total is less than 1.1 1 .1, um, and you don't refinance. Once you refinance, your limit's going to be 750. For one or two homes? Even if you have two homes. The total. Um, so right now, if you've got a mortgage on your first home of 500, and a mortgage on your second home of 400, you're okay because you're under the 1.1. But once you re refinance the mortgage on your first or second home, um, your limit's going to be 750. So what about rental properties that are in an LLC that you file a separate return for? Um, they're still not limited. Um, this is just on your personal residences and your second home, your vacation home. So this is a change that's coming up in 18. Other changes, um, currently for charitable contributions, we can deduct up to 50%, deductions up to 50% of our AGI. Um, our new law, it went from charitable contributions being thrown out the window and not deductible at all to increase to 60 percent. 
So the uh, non-for-profit world has some pretty powerful lobbyists out there in Washington. Um, but, you know, we live in a great state of Utah. We're pretty charitable in this state, so that's great for our state. Um, the one thing, if you're a sports fan, um, that's going to bite. So there's no, there was a deduction for 80% of the rights to purchase tickets. So if you are a uh, part of the boosters up at the University of Utah, you got an email back in December and said, uh, prepay your booster club membership in 17 for 18 because it's not going to be deductible in 18. And this is what they're talking about. Um, a lot of times the booster clubs... The, the membership gives you the right, and that uh, was an 80% deduction. And now for 2018, anything paid in 2018, uh, those rights to purchase those tickets is non-deductible. Uh, you would think the NCAA football would have a little more clout. And, <laughs> Probably keep this in there, but uh, you have a lot of money. And they got a lot of money, but not much cloud on Washington, I guess. So I found that pretty interesting. Um, alimony. This is a big change. Um, currently, if you pay alimony, it's a deduction for you, and if you receive alimony, it's taxable income. Um, starting with the 2018 law starting in 2019 so if you got a divorce in process you're still good with the old law if you get it executed in 2018 but divorce decrees or modifications in 2019 uh, the payer doesn't get a deduction and the receiver doesn't have to pick it up as income so I think this is a big revenue generator because typically the, the people paying alimony have a pretty high tax bracket and the people receiving alimony are in the lower tax bracket. They're paying their spouse and their, their ex-spouse. Ex which is, a month yeah, yeah, a yeah, <coughs> yeah. So th this will be a revenue generator, but it's only on decrees that are executed after 2018. Affordable Care Act. One of our currently, individuals are penalized for not having minimal essential coverage. Um, this has been repealed uh, for 2019, effectively. It's still in effect <coughs> in 2018 and 17, but starting in 2019, there'll be no penalty or not having health care coverage. Um, that'll be great for us because tax repairers were the ACA police. And we had to ask the question and get the documentation on all of our clients if they had minimal essential coverage. And if they didn't, we had to put a fat penalty on their tax return. And those penalties, you know, at least in 2006, uh, for a family of four, I remember one, it was like 2,000 bucks. 2007, it's going to be like 2,400 bucks for not having health care coverage. Um, unfortunately, the employer mandate hasn't gone away. So those of us with more than 50 full-time equivalent employees, we need to be offering health care coverage or face a possible penalty in the future. Um, so it's still a choice we need to make if we've got more than 50 full-time employees. Okay. Um, any questions on the individual? I think that was it. Yeah. So, um, and that's not all the changes. I just kind of hit the highlights. Like I said, you know, we've got uh, 185 pages, and I think about 70 of these pages are issues that affect individuals and there's about 110 pages of <coughs> changes that affect our businesses so let's launch into our businesses the one 
retroactive provision, which is really good, is if you purchased equipment on September 28th or later in 2017, we can deduct 100% of the purchase cost of that piece of equipment, um, no matter what your circumstance. I had a, a client that purchased a $80,000 piece of equipment on September 27th, a day too early. And I said, oh shoot, and he said something a little stronger. <laughs> but that's the rule, acquired and placed in service. Um, after December 27th. Um, this is new and used equipment. Um, the prior bonus provision only was good for new equipment. Um, it's available even if you finance it. You don't have to pay a dime for the thing and you can deduct the full cost. Um, so I'm, I'm sure the equipment dealers were on the phone with their clients when this thing passed in uh, December. Well, they're always on the phone trying to buy, get you to buy equipment in December anyway. Um, so we've got this provision for quite a while. Um, it's part of 17, 18, all of 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. In 23, it drops to 80%. In 24, 60%. In 25, it drops to 40%. And in 26, it drops to 20%. 20 percent. Um, but we've got other provisions that will help us with deducting our equipment. But this is going to uh, be the way we live for the next eight years, uh, using this provision to write off all of our equipment the year we buy it. Uh, this is an election, so we can elect to do it or not to do it. So if we're having a really poor year, and we've got very little taxable income, we may not elect this provision in that year um, because we're in a lower tax bracket already. Um, but if we're in a normal tax bracket for us or a higher than normal tax bracket for us, we're certainly going, going to elect this provision um, if we've purchased equipment during the year. Um, so this is very small business friendly. We really like this provision. Um, Uh, the other provision in the tax law affecting equipment purchases was section 179. Under current law, the limit of the deduction is $510,000 um, unless we've purchased more than $2 million of equipment and that five ten dollars phases out. Uh, the new law, our section 179 deduction is limited to a million dollars, so um, which this is more flexible than the bonus provision. The bonus provision we have to elect, and if we elect it, we've got to treat everything, all our equipment purchases equally. But with the Section 179 deduction, we can pick and choose um, what piece of equipment we apply this to. So this is a great tool in planning and getting your taxable income right where we want it. We do tax planning, and and so if we're having a mediocre year and we don't, we want to take advantage of those low tax brackets, those 10, 15 percent tax bracket. Uh, we don't want to wipe all of our income out. We can use this provision to um, deduct our equipment, and instead of um, using the other provision where we have to elect it for all of our purchases. So if we purchased a hundred thousand dollars of equipment. We read off a whole hundred thousand dollars of it, but if we use Section 179, we can take a deduction for fifty thousand of that hundred thousand, or forty thousand, or whatever gets our income to the level we want to. Um, again, this the phase out point has raised to two hundred two point five million dollars, um, and this is pretty cool uh, for us. It's it encompasses HVAC and fire protection. 
that we install for our customers. So this could be a sales point for us. Um, if we do um, a tenant improvement for somebody and we do an HVA system um, or a fire protection system, they can write 100% of that cost off in the year we install that and get it up and running. Um, so this is good for our clients that we work for because they can accelerate the deduction on some of the work that we do. Um, for passenger automobiles, um, in the past we couldn't deduct them very quickly. Um, <coughs> our bigger pickup trucks um, were eligible for Section 179 and we could deduct the full cost of the pickup truck if it had a six footer bed and GBW of more than 6,000 pounds. Uh, but for our automobiles, uh, we were stuck with 3,160 the first year. Starting in 2018, they've increased that to 10,000. So the automobile industry has a good lobbyist, obviously. Um, in the second year, it's, it goes from 5,100 to 16,000. In the third year, from 3,050 to 9600 and then in the fourth and remaining years um, it went from 1875 to um, 5760 um, so we can ride our that Porsche that we bought uh, pretty quickly now or whatever fun car you bought for your business to make those sales calls um, other changes um, in the past, if we did an exchange on a piece of equipment, um, so say we've got a pickup truck and we trade it in, get $10,000 of value of, of trade-in value, reduce the price that we had to pay for that $60,000 pickup down to 50 because we traded in a truck worth $10,000, uh, we wouldn't have to pick up the income on that pickup truck we traded. Well, now with the 2018 law, um, like-kind exchanges, also known as 1031 exchanges, only apply to real property, not our equipment. Um, so, like I said before, we, we typically we, we trade in a piece of equipment or a vehicle. Um, now, under the new law, the trade-in value, we pick it up as income but we also add it to the basis of that new vehicle or piece of equipment we purchased and we can deduct it using that um, bonus appreciation or section 179 uh, we talked about before so bottom line we end up in the same place um, but just a change in the tax laws now we have to think of so now some tax laws that really affect us in the construction industry. In the past, we've gotten a 9% deduction for the income from our construction activities. It was called the domestic production activity deduction. Um, so that applied to our construction activity, but not our service activity. Um, and so if we had a, a service line in our business, uh, we didn't get that 9% for the service line. Um, under the new law, everybody, all businesses, construction, um, service line, um, retail businesses, get a 20% deduction uh, of all pass-through income. Is anybody a C corporation in here? You are. Okay. So you can check out for the next five minutes. <laughs> We're changing. Oh, you're changing though. Okay. And That's we good. got three, two more years. Okay. Okay. What was that uh, deduction called again? Domestic what? Domestic production activity deduction. So that's in play for 2017 yet. So starting in 2018, those of us that are S Corps or LLC, the income from our business passes 
out of our business, our business doesn't pay the tax on it, we do personally. And so that income ends up on our personal return. Uh, and so, so just say, for instance, we had $200,000 of income from our pass-through business. Um, so now we get a 20% deduction, 20% of $200,000 is $40,000. So now the net tax effect of our business income is 160 rather than 200. So we lost that in our 9% deduction, but we picked up a 20% deduction. So those of us in the construction industry, we are, our tax rates are going to be 10% lower minimum next year. Uh, and so... I guess I should have held a lot more money than I, than I did. You should have held as much as you could, my friend. Um, because we, we were telling our clients, we want to get your income in 2017 as low as you can uh, because that's a permanent tax deduction, permanent tax savings, um, if you can push that income into 18 or 19. Uh, so um, I hope your tax advisors got with you this December and said, you know, we need to really put our tax planning to the, to the test here and minimize our taxable income in 2017. Um, unless our and you shouldn't have had a poor year in 17 unless you had a couple of bad jobs that were big and bad. Uh, because in 17, things were good. In 18 and 19, uh, according to what Dave and I heard yesterday uh, from The Economist, are going to be great too. So um, this, is, this is really big for us. So you couple this with that second slide I showed you where all the tax rates are lower in all the tax brackets except that one, um, we're going to pay fewer taxes for the next 10 years. Um, be, and why I say 10 years is to get this tax uh, law to meet the regulations, it had to um, add less than $1.5 trillion to the national debt in the next 10 years. Um, and in order to get that to happen, they had to sunset a lot of these provisions, uh, which sunsets in 2025, a lot of them. Um, and so, unless, you know, something happens in Congress drastically and they change this whole thing again in four years, that's a possibility too. But um, this is, a, these, these tax revisions are in play for the most part for the next 10 years. And then we'll see what, what happens. Um, and so this 20% deduction um, does not apply to personal service businesses. Um, accountants were left out. Attorneys were left out. Um, consulting athletes were left out. But somehow, the top line, architects and engineers got left in just like they did for domestic production activity deduction. They, those, that AIA must have one heck of a lobbyist because they got in on domestic production activity deduction and they didn't get left out of this 20% um, tax deduction. Um, I, I just can't get over that. They just, that AIA, those architects and engineers, they must have some lobbyist group. Uh, because even the attorneys got left out, and they've got strong lobbyists. But um, so doctors, lawyers, accountants, um, athletes, consultants, financial services, brokerage—they got left out of the 20% deduction. Unless here's the next slide: unless their income is less than $350,000. Um, then they can take advantage of the 20% deduction. So by no means did the tax law get simpler. This calculation for this 20% deduction is going to be a headache because it's limited by a few other things. Just like domestic production activity deduction was limited by wages, so is this. So 
if you're over that three hundred and fifteen thousand um, dollar income provision where you're automatically in uh, we've got a few hurdles to jump to take advantage of this twenty percent deduction um, so it's fifty percent of wages um, from our pass-through entity so if you've got it, it shouldn't be a hurdle for any of us because we've got plenty of wages in our businesses um, but for those in the real estate industry um, they've got another provision so it's 25 percent of wages plus 2.5 percent of their qualified property so if you've got your real estate in a separate entity uh, and have rental income from that entity you can still get the 20 percent um, if you've got enough qualified property so your deductions can be limited to 2.5 percent of your qualified property so if you've got a million dollar building 2.5 percent of that is $25,000 um, and see so your income to get take advantage of that full $25,000 is going to be what is that that's uh, $500,000 so if you've got $500,000 from your rental business um, no it's not it's gonna be 200,000 sorry um, you get you can get the twenty five thousand dollar deduction if you've got a million dollars worth of property. Um, so companies with real estate can take advantage of this, even though they don't have wages. It's kind of the bottom line here. So you know our dear president has a lot of property, um, probably doesn't have a lot of wages managing that property. So um, his buddies got this passed to uh, be able to take advantage of that limit. Um, so if you've got your equipment in a separate entity and you rent it back to your operating entity, um, this still works um, because you've got qualified property in that, in that equipment holding company. Um, so for us as an industry, um, this is very favorable and we should be able to take advantage of that 20% deduction. Um, meals and entertainment. Um, currently we've got no... So the big change was no deduction for entertainment expenses. So if you didn't pay for your jazz tickets in 2017, um, where you got at least a 50% deduction, um, your jazz tickets, when you buy your season tickets next fall, um, none of that's going to be deductible. So the uh, entertainment industry and the athletes kind of took a hit on this tax legislature because they don't qualify for the 20% deduction. You know, there's none of those athletes that make less than 315,000, um, and we can't deduct going to the jazz games anymore. Um, meals, business meals are still. 50% deductible, including our <coughs> field employees. When we send somebody out of town and we pay for their meals, only 50% of those meals are deductible. Um, and that really stinks because it's really a cost of doing business out of town. So we've got to split up the cost of those meals or the per diem and only deduct 50% of that. Um, this, this really stinks. I don't really like this, but that's the way it is. Um, interest. Interest paid by our companies. Uh, if you have gross receipts more than $25,000 in your business, the interest that you pay may be limited um, to the sum of our interest income plus 30% of our adjusted gross income plus our flooring interest for those of us that are dealers. So for us in this room and listening via satellite here, 
and we've got and our business is more than 25 million dollars our interest expense is limited to our interest income plus 30 percent of our adjusted gross income um, so this shouldn't affect us too much when years are good but when years are bad um, we our interest could be limited so the moral of this story is um, split out that building that you're paying interest on out of your operating company. Don't buy that building in your operating company if your operating company has more than $25 million of revenue in a year. Um, so that's really the only way that's going to affect us because we shouldn't have that terrible much interest that we pay other than our equipment loans. Um, that should be should be less than 30% of our income um, unless we lose money. Uh, the good news is that interest deduction would carry forward two years and that we can take it. Um, so this affects our bigger businesses. Um, the other thing that affects um, a lot of our clients and some people in this room I'm sure right now um, the <coughs> cash basis of accounting is only available to those of us with gross receipts of less than ten thousand um, dollars. This is the one thing that is going to simplify things for a lot of us. Um, if we're between that ten million dollar range and the twenty five million dollar range <coughs> starting in 2018 we are eligible for the cash basis of accounting. Well, what does that do for me? Well on the cash basis of accounting we don't have to recognize income on invoices until we receive that money. So we only recognize income on cash that we've received and we get deductions for cash that we've paid out. And so mm -hmm. we can defer any income that's in our receivables net of what's in our payables. Um, so this is this is a great tool for those of us that are between the 10 and 25 million dollar range. You said 10, 000, you meant 10, million. 10 million, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so if we're between the 10 million and 25 million dollar range, um, starting in 2018, we can go to the cash basis of the county, uh, which which is really good. It's, uh, because typically your accounts receivable is more than your, your accounts payable. If it's the other way around, your accounts payable is bigger than your accounts receivable in cash you're on the road to bankruptcy. You're in trouble. And you're probably not paying any taxes anyway. So it doesn't do you any good. But typically our receivables are substantially higher than our payables uh, because a big part of our receivables is the labor that we've got on the job and we've paid that out already. Um, and our payables is just the material that we've used. So this is a great provision uh, for that mid-range contractor that's between 10 and 15 million dollars. Um, we're really excited about this. We can't wait uh, for next year when we've changed a bunch of our contractors to the cash basis of accounting and they've deferred a million to a million or two in income. Uh, so they're going to pay very little tax in 18 because of the change in method. Um, so we've got a, a lot of our contract well, a handful of contractors in our office that are pretty excited about this. Why? Why were they not already cash basis? What was what? What changed? Oh well, they they had to go off of cash basis once they <coughs> went past ten million dollars in revenue. Ten million. Ten million. Um, and I've got a contractor that I've actually got two contractors that just bumped over that ten million dollar range for 2017. So for 2017, they had it got to be on the accrual basis, and then in 2018, they can go back to cash basis. So 2017 is going to suck for them, but once we get back to 2018, it can get back on the cash basis. We can defer a bunch of income for them again. Is this the way? Oh, isn't this how it's always been if you were an S corp? Um, S corp, C corp, LLC. You could always be on the cash basis okay. up to 10 million dollars. Okay, so there's really no change no. up to that. Okay. No. 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 Well, actually, C Corp could only be on cash basis up to $5 million. Yeah. Um, so, 
S corps and LLCs could be on the cash basis up to 10 million. So this is an exciting provision for for us um, in this industry and it probably in this association. Um, there's probably a number of us in that 10 to 25 million dollar range. Um, C corporations, uh, Ralph, wake up here. Your tax rate is going to be a flat 21 percent. So um, starting after 2017, so starting next year. Next year. Um, and you're not going to be affected by alternative minimum tax anymore. So now the question is, if I'm an S Corp or an LLC, um, should I switch uh -huh. to a C Corporation? That their top tax rate is only 21%. Um, so let's go through the numbers real quick. So the top tax rate for C Corporation is 21%. That's the tax paid by the C Corporation. But to get any money out of that C Corporation other than wages, that is a dividend. And dividend rates are still 15% for most of us, 20% or 20, that's going to be 23.8% if you're over that $479,000 taxable income range. But most of us are under that, but our dividend rate is still going to be 15%. So you add 21 plus 15, that's 36%. So the top individual tax rate net of that 20% deduction is 29.6. So we still want to be an S Corp or an LLC. And or convert our C Corporation to an S Corporation when we can. It's you actually can, a five year. You can change every five years. Um, so, if you're a C corporation, um, it's good to be a C corporation for a few years, possibly, if you're not going to take any money out, if you're going to build up your equity in that, in that business, because then you're paying top tax rate of 21%. But once you <coughs> kind of establish enough equity in, in your business, um, then you do not want to be a C corporation once you start taking dividends or but distributions. from when you were a C corporation, you're still going to be taxed as dividend. When you yeah, pay, if you take that out, you're still going to pay dividend on that. You had to keep track of it separate. Yeah, yeah. So you've got uh, two sets of funds there. One set of funds that was taxed as a C corporation, another set of <clears throat> um, funds in your equity that it was taxed as an S corporation or LLC, uh, S corporation. Um, that you can take out tax-free because you've already paid tax on already, but those uh, C corporate earnings, um, you can only take those out if you pay a dividend on them. Um, so you don't want to switch to a C, uh, C corp unless you're going to go public. I don't think any of us in the room want to go public. Um, the other big thing is uh, gift and estate tax. So currently we have an exemption of $2.5 million. Uh, so I've got that. My wife's got a $2.5 million exemption. So between me and my wife, if my estate is less than $11 million. My kids don't have to pay any estate tax. Um, and the new law, it doubled. So now I've got an $11 million deduct exemption from estate tax. My wife has an $11 million uh, exemption from estate tax. And so we're not going to have to pay ex um, estate tax unless we win the lottery. Because my estate is definitely less than $22 million. Um, but uh, so if your estate is over, $22 million, um, you still got some estate tax planning to do. But if it's under, um, your estate, your businesses can pass to your heirs tax free, um, which is good news for small businesses. So, any questions? I know that's a lot of technical jargon. Uh, 
hope you understood the highlights of it. So um, if so you've much got, easier. yeah, so much for getting easier. It is definitely not easier. Um, like I said before, just the so documentation. Job security is still there, then, huh? Yeah, <laughs> accountants still have job security. Um, it's it's not any simpler, and um, th this is an interesting read. It's 185 pages, and it's just the changes. And if you flip through here, um, you can kind of get a feel for how Congress works, because there are some provisions in here uh, that are pretty innocuous um, and affect a very small band of people. Um, there's oil industry, um, Alaska Native Settlement Trust, I don't even know what that is, um, reduced rate on excise tax on beer, I don't know, maybe the cost of beer will go down. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of interesting provisions, but uh, hopefully I highlighted the provisions, I know I highlighted the main provisions that are going to affect you as business owners and individuals. So with that, it's 7 o'clock. I will turn it over to Dave. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, the information and realize that uh, we need to get a hold of someone like yourself to sort through all that. Uh, just one uh, other item. Because we're going to be down in St. George next month, we will not have a meeting such as this in February. We'll be back here in March. So uh, thank you for everybody for coming and make sure you sign the roll so I can give you credit. Uh, Kel, I don't know if you got to. And uh, we're excited to have you all and those who are online. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is uh, so much for a postcard, right? Yeah, uh, not a postcard. It would have been nice. I'll try to notice it sooner. I was going to get it. Uh, I forgot. Kel called. Kel called. So, this was one tax act that I could get excited about. The last small tweaks in the last 10 years have been terrible. That have been terrible. Yeah. This one is bad. This, it, yeah. It makes a difference of when you take stuff this, this year. Yeah. Like yeah. you were saying. Yeah. So, so it, you've got to get your tax plan come down as much as you can in yeah. 17 somehow. Yeah. You know, if you haven't taken action to do that. Um, we bought five trucks on December 31st. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Well. Uh, yeah. That last on the week. 29th oh, on Saturday God. or Friday. I've never seen so many people uh, buying cars really and trucks really? and vehicles at okay. Performance yeah, Ford. Oh, <laughs> that last week was just. He said that they sold. He, the guy that sells ours. I think he said he sold 30 cars that week. 40 cars that week. Yeah. Jeez. Did they have an inventory? They had to order to buy it. No, they were either bought or you had to have them. You had to have it, you got to place it in service. You got to put it in service. Account. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That one deduction for HVAC, roofing, so forth. So it had to be in Was that residential or residential and commercial? That's just Did you buy your car? Just commercial yeah. building. So if I put yeah. a roof in my building. Uh, yep. You can deduct the full cost. Fire. Yep. Yep. Protection. I can get that. Yep.